Okie dokie, everybody ready to go again? Okay. <laughs> Everybody's telling me they're really enjoying it, and we have a large variety of speakers. <laughs> a lot of interesting things. Okay, our next speaker is Carol Pate. And I want to say, she didn't like me to call her an old, old, old friend. <laughs> but I feel, like, I feel like I've known her forever. Yeah, 25 years. 25 years mm -hmm. of when you, I think we were, I wasn't even doing what I was no, doing. No, I told you you were going to be doing this stuff. Yeah, you did. <laughs> and it was before she was married to her present husband, so I've known her a long time. Oh, yeah. But I've seen her evolve, too. But uh, Carol is now a regular on the Psychic Detective Show mm -hmm. on Court TV. And I don't know how many times you've done, eight or more? Seven. Seven? Mm -hmm. The show's on there, and so she's a regular on there. Last year at our conference, we showed a video where she helped solve a serial murder case. And you said you work on three to 500 murder cases a year? Yeah. Three to 500 murder cases a year she's called in on. I cut it down. <laughs> You said sometimes three or five a day or more? Well, I was doing two a day. But you had to cut back on I had those. to cut back, yeah. Uh -huh. But she was called in on her first murder case when she was 12 years old. So it's been a long time. I'll tell some of this and you can fill it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> because the amazing thing is when she's working on the murder cases, she said she sees it through the eyes of the victim and the eyes of the killer. Mm -hmm. So she's been stabbed, shot, strangled, <laughs> feel all of the emotions that the person's going through when they're dying, which I don't, would not want to do. No. <laughs> it hurts. It hurts, okay. But it's something, you've not learned to shut that part out, but... I've learned to damper it, because okay. I'll touch and then let go. Because otherwise you couldn't, you couldn't survive. Well, one case put me in the bed for a week. Okay. Yeah, it was, it was, I was going to give up. No. Never do murder cases again. Then I went to Chicago. Okay. And I was walking down the street, got hit with a murder case. Let's get you over <laughs> here anyway. But um, also she is like an investigator. She goes all over the world looking for mysteries. She's, you've been, I want to think about the only one who's been down under the Sphinx to find the tunnels under the Sphinx. I found the tunnel to the Sphinx. To the Sphinx, mm -hmm. underneath there. Mm -hmm. She found the Shogun's treasure in Japan. Mm -hmm. She's been called in on things in China mm -hmm. and all over the world. So it's not just uh, with the psychic, the murder cases and missing people, but also mysteries. Mysteries. Everywhere in the world they call her in. So this is a fascinating woman. <laughs> So she's going to tell you about, well, you just said you're going to talk about your stuff. Okay. Yeah, I'll talk about my stuff. <laughs> All right. It's Carol Pate. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And she does have the, the, what is it, the Carol Pate Psychic Center yes. in Little Rock. And she works with people down there. Okay. I was born and raised in San Jose, California. And that's where I worked on my first murder case. I was 12 years old, the police department came up to my house, which was way in the country. And they said, a classmate of yours has disappeared. We think that he came to see you. I touched into the picture of my classmate. And I looked at them and I said, he's been shot in the back. He's dead. He's out in the woods. And they said, where? I said, behind his house, about a mile. And they said, who shot him? I said, there was a young Hispanic boy that was walking behind him with a shotgun. He tripped, and the gun went off and shot him in the back. And they said, take us to where he, was, where he is. I said, I can't take you there. I was 12. I'm a child. Well, they found his body a mile behind his house, been shot in the back young Hispanic boy. He told the police what happened. They believed him. That started out <laughs> my career. 
Now, I didn't always want to be a psychic, you understand. This is not by choice. This is what you get born into, unless you hit your head really hard or something. <laughs> so I'd been seeing people who had passed over since I was three, four years old, probably beyond that. I didn't know if people were alive or, quote, dead. I couldn't tell if people were in body or out of body all my life. So that was a common thread for me. Needless to say, whenever I'd work on murder cases, I'd have to ask myself, are they in body or out of body? And I could usually tell by the pain I encountered. So when I work on murder cases, I feel what the victim feels. If they get stabbed, I get stabbed. Okay? The worst thing I ever encountered was being hit by a train. Oh my God. I was not okay for three hours. Yeah, that was bad. Don't ever get hit by a train. <laughs> you can have your head chopped off, but the train, no. Now, the way I work is through psychometry. This has been a means of control for me. This helps me to deal. When I touch, I tune into the energy frequency of the individual. When I let go, I let go so I can turn it on and release it. Now what I've learned to do with murder cases, I tap in, if it gets too bad, I let go. So I don't suffer to the degree that I used to, okay? Psychometry is a wonderful thing to learn. Uh, each human being has their own unique energy, frequency, signature. No two are exactly alike, even with identical twins. So when I touch in, that's my antenna, it's like tuning in a radio station. Or with me, it's like TV. Okay? And once I'm there, I can find out anything I need to know. As a murder victim, I see what they see. If they see the perpetrator, I see the perpetrator. If they don't, I don't. In which case, I have to go to where the murder took place. Then I tune into that area, touch into it. Once I had to use a rock that gave me all the information I needed on the murder. I heard everything that was said through this rock. Then I can be the perpetrator. I know why they did it. But the worst thing about it is I know how they felt. And I'm here to tell you I'd much rather be the victim than the perpetrator. There was one, he was a serial murderer. He was the first serial murderer I had ever tapped into. I had to throw up. I was so sick. It was horrendous. And unfortunately, I work with a lot of serial murder cases. It's the end thing. <laughs> Pardon? What do you do to cleanse yourself? What I do to cleanse myself is number one, I take a salt bath. Iodized table salt, third of a cup to the bath water, get it from head to toe, especially back in through here. It releases that energy from my body, okay? And then I go watch something funny. I do a lot of TV. Most psychics, I understand, do a lot of TV. I understand that. I can get lost. I turn my brain off. I turn it all off, and I am there. Needless to say, I have a 61-inch screen. <laughs> I do. <laughs> and guess what I watch? 
CSI. <laughs> and horror movies. Hey, that's where you go. <laughs> it's more horrible sometimes than what I deal with, so it's better. I'm going to tell you a little bit about how I function because I'm just like you guys, okay? You know, I get up, I don't do the breakfast, I should. Uh, I drink my tea, I get ready, I go to work, you know, I, I do all the things that you guys do. But with me, I'm like ultra sensitive and you guys can probably relate going to Walmart, okay? Killer. Okay. I cannot go to funerals, even if I don't know the person. I pick up the empathy. When you sit down in a chair that somebody has sat in that was hurting, you pick up the pain. People don't understand that everything is energy. And you're leaving your trace energy on everything and everywhere that you go. Your jewelry holds your frequencies. I can pick up a piece of your jewelry and I can tell you about yourself because you're in that jewelry. <laughs> Any ring? Do I get to keep it? <laughs> the ring. <laughs> oh, cool. That, that might work. Okay. All of you have psychic abilities. That's how you function in this world. You haven't learned to necessarily trust it. With me, I trust my psychic abilities 100%. Okay? You need to start doing that as well. And where you get it is in the solar plexus, right here. When it contracts, you're in danger. You know when a car cuts you off? Yeah, it's that feeling. The difference between you and me is I ask questions. Where is this coming from? What is this? Who is this coming from? What's going on here? And I give myself an opportunity to let the information come in. I can walk into a house and I'll feel an energy. Maybe somebody died in that house. And I'll feel an energy and I'll walk up into it and I'll go, okay, somebody has died here. Because I recognize the feel of the energy. When someone is murdered, there is a bubbling that comes up of blood into my throat. I know they've been murdered. It's trauma. And that's the only way I can ex describe it. If somebody passes normally, then I have to ask, are they in body or are they out of body? Because you can't die. And I'm gonna tell you something else. You can't die before your time, even with murder. Victims start saying their goodbyes to their families before they get murdered by a total stranger. They start clearing things up, bringing closure before they die. That's why I don't have any fear. I can't die before my time. And I've had threats. Well, <laughs> Go for it. I can't die before my time. <laughs> That's right, because there's no such thing as death. Death is a transition. When I, as a child, saw so many people who had transitioned, they appeared just like you and me. They didn't appear, well, one lady appeared with a throat cut, but normally they appeared just as they were. There was a woman I used to wave to every day. I had to walk to the bus, and 
she lived in this big old Victorian house and there was a half moon balcony and she'd come out and she'd wave to me and I'd wave back every day for about two years. And then I didn't see her and I saw people moving into the house. So I went to the family that there was a Spanish land grant all around there. So I went to the family that pretty much knew everyone that lived there and asked them what happened to the little old lady. They said, what little old lady? Well, the one that lived in the house. They said, oh, you mean grandmother? She's been dead for 20 years. <laughs> what, do you, what do you do? So, <laughs> yeah. And that's been my life. Now, I don't just do psychic detective work, okay? Actually, that's a minimal part of what I do. I do healing work. Uh, I do basic readings, helping people, counseling people through hard times. Because a lot of times, you want to know why people are doing the things that they're doing. Why are they being so mean? Why are they being so cruel? I get a picture of them, I tap into them. This is why, and this is what you need to do. Comes in really handy, especially going through divorce. <laughs> well, he's got his stuff hidden. And he's cheating with <laughs> she, too. Uh, <laughs> this goes both ways there. And I do a lot of teaching. And I work with stones, the energy of stones, with my healing work. I work with flower essences, F.E.S. Bach. They talk to me. The flower essences talk to me and they tell me what they do. And I travel. That's actually where I learned about the flower essences. I didn't know anything about them. I was in Egypt. I was working on the Shore Project. It was with Edgar Casey Foundation and Dr. Joseph Shore. And this was in 97. And I went there because I knew Boris Said, who was producer, director. And I told him where there was a tunnel leading from the pyramid to the base of the Sphinx. And he made sure that I went there. Dr. Shore brought me out to Egypt. And I had absolute full run of the plateau for 23 days. I could go anywhere. If there was a locked door, I'd say I want it unlocked. They unlocked it. It was awesome. I spent three hours in the king's chamber and about an hour in the queen's chamber, which was awesome. Awesome. And J.J. Hertek, I don't know if you're familiar, was with us. Yeah, it was, it was something else. He, he waved. <laughs> Hawass did not want us to find anything, nothing. There was a chamber that used to be a well. There was a causeway that leads from the Great Pyramids to the Sphinx. This well was to the right. And it had completely dried up. Well, mostly dried up. It was pretty muddy. And it was 300 feet deep. And I had to climb this little ringed ladder 300 feet down that was muddy and the rings were only about like that. That was fun. Dr. Shore got lifted down. <laughs> He's the money man. When I went down there, I found a temple. And it was niched just like the interior of the Great Pyramid. And there were human remains, bones, scattered everywhere. And when I went down, 
as I entered in on the floor, which was muddy, was a black granite sarcophagus lid without a lip. Now they don't make them without a lip. This didn't have a lip. And I knew that this was placed there by the priest because that is what I had seen before ever coming there. And there had been a battle inside and that's why the remains were in there. And I held a thigh bone and I tuned into it and I saw the battle and I told them if you lift this sarcophagus lid you will find an entry to a tunnel and that tunnel runs from the Great Pyramid to the base of the Sphinx. Hawass did not want us to lift that, okay? About three months later he did a big special on Channel 16 where he had found a tomb. Yeah. Osiris's tomb. Mm -hmm. That was that temple. They did secretly lift the lid. Guess what they found? A tunnel, an entry. And the tunnel was full of water. And underneath the Sphinx, there are nine chambers. One of those is an antechamber, which is at the very tail of the Sphinx. It's 12 feet down. The other chambers are staggered. The one under the right paw is 90 feet long and 200 feet down. I got to sit at the paw of the Sphinx. You can't imagine. <laughs> It was awesome. It was absolutely awesome. And I saw processions. I saw initiations at the temple of the Sphinx. There were initiations there. And the Great Pyramid was used for initiations. They were not tombs. And the Great Sphinx dates way back, a minimum of 10,500 B.C. Now, Boris did put that out on Mysteries of the Sphinx with Charlton Heston a long time ago, 91, 92, somewhere around that. They found two sea anemones that were fossilized, one on the ear and one on the tail of the Great Sphinx. It has been eroded by water, okay? Which means it's been underwater. But you don't hear about this. This goes into that <sighs> antiquities that everybody hides, forbidden archeology span that everybody hides because they're afraid if you guys find out, you might throw a fit. Or you might call them in and say, wait a minute, what's the truth? Hawass. Hawass worries about Hawass. And if it means tourism, then that's important too. No, it's more than that. They don't want to reveal it because it messes up their history and their religion. Their religion is based on 6,000 years. They cannot mess that up, so they hide it. There was a text that was found. My guides had given me the information to what was on that text, and I read that. I didn't read it. I saw it, but I gave that information to Dr. Shore, what that text said, and it talked about people from the stars coming down and building these great buildings and implementing the belief system and training uh, various priests 
to do initiations. When I told Dr. Shore this, it kind of blew his mind because he had just looked at that particular papyrus. And all of that information was done in red rather than in black because of its importance. That's how I got to go, by the way. When I gave him that information, he figured I must know something. Yeah. Tom DeBecky did soundings with the chambers while I was there, and there was definitely metal things in the chamber, a number of things that were in those chambers. My information was that the Hall of Records contained crystals, like crystal tablets, or and they weren't tablets, they were crystal almost want to say it looks like a scroll, cylinders that had information put into it. But you had to know how to retrieve the information. But I believe those are there. I also believe that there is huge medical technology that's in those chambers that predate anything you can imagine. I'm going to go ahead and open it up for questions now, since I've stimulated something. Yes? The initiations in the Great Pyramid were to become priests. And it was to delete yourself of fear, to remove it from you. Yes? something that my spirit guide told me to bring to you. May I give it to you? Right now? Well, yeah. It's not going to jump out at you. <laughs> <laughs> it's an African amethyst, and my spirit guide said that you would know what it was used for. And I collect stones, so this morning I found my African amethyst, and I'm bringing it to you. Can we wait until sure. after, and I'll be glad to. Sure. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. It's for spiritual. High spirituality, high vibration, third eye. Okay. Where'd my questions go to? <laughs> what about uh, Barbara Handclaw? Barbara Handclaw, she talks about some of those initiations by those ancient cultures in actually are harmful. Um, have you seen that? Like, she, for example, she talked about Mayan initiations. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, it involves sacrifice, but even if without sacrifice, uh, it could be taking your power away. How did you perceive that in the Egyptian? The Egyptian, the high rituals were not negative. They were very high, although they were very... How can I put this? Oh, less based lust based. The Queen's Chamber is very lust based. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Isis, going back to Isis. But they were not harmful. They didn't do blood initiations. Your Mayan did blood initiations, but they also used plants and uh, hallucinogenics and that could harm you. So there were problems with, but you, people take a concept and then they make it theirs and it becomes tainted from the original, what it was originally used for. The shaman in the original would go out, touch the plants, and they would tell the shaman what they were used for, what you could do with them. They had a complete, how can I put it? They knew and felt nature as it truly was. It was a consciousness with intelligence that could communicate to them. 
But then it got, it got changed. And then you had to get on these plants to hallucinate so you could even make contact with the plants, and then you probably didn't. And then you had to cut something to make sure that you left a little blood. And it went to the point where they were taking people's hearts out. The, one of the original, when I was in, uh, where was I? Uh, I guess it was Peru. No, it was Bolivia. And there was paintings of this chieftain that was so afraid because his people were starving to death because the rains had stopped, okay? So he was told by the gods to bring to the gods a great communicator. So he found in his group of natives the most well-liked person that could communicate the absolute best who would sacrifice their life to go speak with the gods. It was not a cruel act. It was an act of love that got totally misunderstood and changed. Then the rains came and it saved the tribe. I think that history has done its own spin Okay? Whatever suited them and whatever brought to us. Look at George Washington. Chopped the tree down, didn't he? <laughs> Questions? Yes? Uh, I've heard that Casey said in some readings that uh, our, our Lord Jesus and John the Baptist went through initiations ceremonies at the pyramids. Uh, do you know anything about that? Actually, I really don't. I mean, I know that Christ was trained uh, Isaiah, Moses, and there was one other that came down and trained Christ, as well as the Great White Brotherhood, which helped to train Christ when it came close to being his time. But I don't know of the initiations that you speak of. Oh, very well. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes? Can we go back and sure. talk a little more about you as a person and your experience growing up, having disabilities, and some of the joy and difficulties that you have faced doing this? That's a whole day, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> She wants to know more about my background and what it was like for me growing up and the things that I faced. Well, let's see. My parents thought I was crazy. Um, my father was an atheist. My mother was a Baptist. Both of my grandfathers were Baptist ministers on either side. I was raised in the First Baptist Church. Um, <laughs> the minister didn't like it when I spoke up during the time that he was teaching, saying, okay, Cain slew Abel, and he went to the city, and he built the city called Nod, and he got married. Who'd he marry? You know, I did stuff like that. In school, I went up to my second grade teacher, and I said, it's okay, your husband left you, but he'll be home in a week. Please don't cry. I went up to my gym teacher and said, congratulations on your baby. She wasn't married. I mean, it was, it was, it was terrible. Try dating. You're not taking me there. You think you are, but you're not. It was horrible. I was called a witch. I didn't know what a witch was. I was a Baptist, for God's sakes. 
I had to go. <laughs> I had to go get books to find out what a witch was, okay? And it was a different religion. And I wasn't a paganist. I was a Baptist. I sang the old rugged cross for Pete's sakes. <laughs> I tried. So it was, it was very, very difficult for me. I broke a five ring prostitution and drug ring when I was 16. Okay. I got one of America's most wanted on the murder list, a mafia hitman, when I was 21. I couldn't escape it. I tried. You know, I mean, I didn't. In my day, you didn't, they weren't called psychics. They were, yeah. <laughs> They're weirdos, you know, or fortune tellers. I'm not a fortune teller. Although I, I, I did learn how to read palms. No, I'm not going to. <laughs> yeah, Carol, didn't you also? Uh, talk about the, this one murderer that was stalking you, parking outside your house or something. <laughs> oh, that was recent. That's recent, okay. Yeah, I worked on a murder case 20 years ago. The family came to me because their son had disappeared, okay? And I told them he has been murdered. He was murdered over a girl this girl said that he raped her when he didn't and her boyfriend is the one that murdered him and he has been placed in quote a blue hole okay that's as far as i got with that case right well, the police tracked everything down well it turns out that the murderer was the boyfriend of the girl that claimed that this kid had raped her and he confessed it on the stand. But he was also a multiple personality. Okay? So the shadow, that's what he called one of his personalities, okay? Said, yes, I did kill him for raping the girlfriend. But you won't know where he is. So the father of this kid who did the murder started sending me threats, calling me on the phone. He showed up in front of my place, and he started to semi-stalk me, okay? I blew him off. Found out that he was an ex-ATF, and he had blown people up and liked to put bombs in mailboxes, and he was a crazy man. So he called me up and I said, look, you're a crazy man. Go away. And you're not going to scare me, period, because I'm protected by God. Click. His family shows up on my doorstep last week. His wife, his kids, and the grandkids, and I think a neighbor. They say to me, we want your help. We want to get our brother, our son, out of prison. We believe he's innocent. We know you worked on the case, and we know that people listen to you because you've been on TV. We want your help. I said, no. Your father stalked me. He threatened my life. And the wife says, yeah, he does that to me a lot, too. <laughs> She says, as a matter of fact, I'm getting a divorce. And I said, well, look, I'm not going to help him. I'm not helping you. And I believe that your father and husband was involved in this murder case. I believe he helped his son dispose of the body. I'm not touching it. You don't want me to touch it. Because I'll prove him guilty again. Yeah. The question is, she wants to know about Morgan Nick. Morgan Nick, thank you. 
As a matter of fact, when Morgan Nick disappeared, the very next day, Channel 7 showed up on my doorstep and asked me, they brought a picture of her, and they asked me what happened to her. And I told them what happened, that she'd been kidnapped. I told them the truck and everything, and uh, told them that she was dead, and uh, told them who I believe did this, where he lived, and the street. The guy that I said did it confessed. Morgan Nick's mother said he didn't do it. And that's as far as it got. And I was banned from working on the case by Morgan Nick's mother. Morgan Nick was a, how old is she, seven year old girl that was at a baseball game that got kidnapped and just gone. And we ended up passing a Morgan Nick law in this state, kind of like the Amber Law, over that case. It was a really big case. Do you, You're welcome. Do, you, do you go to bed at night and do you dream this or is it, how does it come to you? I mean, other than somebody knocking at the door and saying we have a case, uh, how do you, how do the answers come to you, the visions, the? No, I'm not medium. I don't do the dreams, okay? <clears throat> What I've had a few rare occasions where I have gotten visions. One was on the Atlanta murder case when the children were being murdered. I kept getting visions of it, okay? So I worked with the FBI on that, and that was the guy that did it, by the way. Uh, there was another case when I was in Memphis. <clears throat> I'd been working on a previous case, and I picked up on a murder case that was uh, a serial murder case, and I told them that they had the wrong man, and that actually the guy that was a serial murderer was, uh, I gave him the description, I told him that he was from, had just recently moved there from the north, and that he was going to kill again and where he was going to kill again. And they got him. So I, basically, I get called into cases. I never seek them. So once in a while, God says, all right, you've got to go do this. Then I go do it. We're running out of time. It says here that you're going to uh, give a quick lesson on reading auras. Oh, yeah. Could you do that? You want to see how, right. you want to be able to see auras? Okay. All of you? Let me okay. make this one remark about Carol, too. You said it was funny. This one woman called you the one morning and said, I just woke up and said, I've decided I'm going to be a psychic detective. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah, that happens to me. To do. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, I, I get calls. I want to be a psychic detective just like you. And they're like 40, 50. One lady was 87. She says, tell me what to do. <laughs> yeah, tell me, tell me how to do it. Honey, if you haven't started by now, you're not going to. Uh, okay. <laughs> and believe me, you don't want to. You just think you do. <laughs> Once you get stabbed a couple of times, you'll get over that real quick. Okay, okay go on with the oral lessons. We got about I need to dim the light just right in here. Can we do that? We got about 10 minutes okay. to give a lesson. Let's turn them down. Okay. I worked on that. I worked with the mother. Okay. On the you know. was it Russellville? No, I didn't work on that one. I worked on Fayetteville. No, I haven't worked on that. This but her boyfriend here. didn't do it. Bring those down? No. Okay. Maybe that's better. Okay. That what better? I want you to do is you will see a light surrounding me, lighter than the background. Better? Now you may have to let your eyes blur. Yeah. But you should see. Now I can fluff my aura. This means that I can 
bring energy to me. And this is the way you do it. You cup your hands slightly and you bring it close to the body. And you just keep doing this until you feel a tingle at the top of your head. You'll see my aura getting larger. See? Isn't that cool? <laughs> okay. The color of the aura, the base color, denotes the character of the individual. All right? And it is based on the chakras. Your chakras are what create the color in your aura. I love to get on planes and, and watch people's auras shift colors. I can tell what they're reading, like if it goes red. Okay, so let's get down the colors of the chakras. Root chakra, red. That's passion, that's creativity, that's anger, that's violence, okay? Next chakra up, orange. That's your balance, your mental sanity is orange, okay? Let me display chakra one. Or the solar, your solar plexus. Solar plexus is between. yellow. Okay, that's in between. That's okay. yellow. That's your balance. It's logic. A lot of teachers have yellow auras. Okay? Green, the heart chakra. Green. Healer, love. Green. Throat chakra, blue. Communication, blue. Speaking, okay, blue. Indigo, third eye. Indigo. Seventh chakra, purple. Now understand, these colors are very pastel. They are not bright, vivid colors. They are pastel. So it's very light. I met a man one time years ago that had this huge blue aura. He was a wonderful communicator. He was awesome. Doctors should have green auras. They should. Now, if you have murkiness, brown tinges to the aura, that means that whatever color that is, it has been tainted. So you get a murky yellow. Okay? You've got somebody who's not balanced and who's a liar. Used car salesmen. Politicians. <laughs> Red and murk. Psychopath. Dangerous. Very, very dangerous. I met a man that had a base yellow aura with red all the way around it. And he, he was a detective, homicide detective, and he could go off like that. Very dangerous. If you have a murky in the indigo or the purple, you've got a fanatic. It's a fanatic. I've only met two people in my entire life that had black auras. Okay? Both of these individuals were Satanists. I'm not talking pretend Satanists, I'm talking Satanists. We turn the lights back on now. If there is a line separating the aura from the body, a black line, it means probable death. If the aura is gone, it means death. You can see your own aura in the mirror if you have a solid background. Just step back and check out, see if you're going to live. <laughs> This is a complete change of subject. Go ahead. Um, do you believe that Tim Russert died of natural causes? I'd have to touch into him to know. 
I, as a psychic, I don't get all information from everything that's going on because I lose my mind, okay? I touch into something to get the signature energy. That's how I work. So have, I don't know. Do you have other members of your family that are also gifted? Uh, Cherokee background, father. Uh, my father was very into all of this, but back in his day, it simply wasn't allowed. His mother was full-blooded Cherokee, and she was a medicine woman. And she had two sisters. One was a medium, one was a clairvoyant. My father did everything in his power, including just beating the crud out of me, to keep me from being who and what I am. Because it was considered to be dangerous. He wanted to protect me. When he almost killed me. Yes? Uh, have you ever been the subject Yes. Yes, I have. Berkeley, California. I was, pardon? When? Whew. 60, uh, came here in 69, 60, around 66, 67. Well, that was a long time ago. Yeah, I was a kid. Yeah, they didn't a little know. kid. They didn't, understand. they didn't even understand this back then. <laughs> yes. Well, I, I was also tested at UALR as well, university here in Arkansas. And basically at Berkeley, they sat me down with a group of scientists and they would hand me things. Like I was handed a Bible and I said, this was with a woman when she died that she had immense grief and guilt that her, because her son had committed suicide. And then they had me something else. It would all be very traumatic things. And it proved out to be correct. That's how they tested me there, okay? At UALR, they did, they did skin tests for the electricity in my skin, and when, especially for healing, because I do a lot of hands-on healing. And mine went up beyond 12 volt, which I guess that's good, I don't know. And they did some other tests. And I had another doctor test me on what food stimulated my psychic ability and what didn't, what worked best, which was steak, by the way. <laughs> Rare. Okay. Isn't she wonderful? <laughs> never know what's hiding in your own backyard. And she's yeah. here in Arkansas. <laughs> okay. Well, she's going to be around for the next two days if you want to ask her questions. But now we're going to have to, to have a break and go on to the next That one. works for me. You can see she can talk a long time. <laughs> okay. Thank All you. Right. Thank so you, Dolores.